We're going to be looking at uh, two or three scriptures today. If you'll get your Bibles out, or if you don't have one, there's probably a pew Bible close to where you're sitting. And uh, if you would get that. <clears throat> Hey, Brother Dan read one of the uh, scriptures in Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. And we're going to be using that along with uh, um, Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. And then our text will be Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And when I read, I'll be reading King James. About 2,000 years ago, there was a young man, he was about 30 years old, and uh, he only preached for about three years, and then they crucified him. And I'm talking about Jesus Christ, or God the Son. You know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. So he came down to earth in the personage of a man, to live as a man, to suffer all the things as a man, as we do. And during this three-year ministry, one of, the, one of these incidents or episodes was, was healing a man uh, sick with the palsy. palsy. And uh, so I wanted to define what that was first. And the reason we're looking at three different scriptures or writers in Matthew, then Mark, and then Luke is because they were wrote by different men with different backgrounds, was it the doctor? And they had different perspectives and different ways of writing, read, writing. And we're going to find out that everything that one wrote, some of the others told in more detail is what we can find out from these three, uh, three Gospels, these three writers. Uh, three authors, they have three views, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but they're all inspired of God. So they wrote what God wanted them to write. We're going to be talking about the miracle of healing the man with palsy. But that's not what we're going to focus on this morning. We're going to focus on the faith that the men, they pronoun, that carried him to where Jesus was speaking, which was a house of overflowing. And the reason I wanted to read uh, this in chapter, chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, he entered into a ship, he passed over, then came to his own city, what was his own city? We're going to find out in some other reading here that we're talking about Capernaum. Uh, he moved his base of operations, Jesus, from uh, Nazareth to Capernaum. You know, that's by uh, the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And Gennesaret, I think, is another name that they, they call the Sea of Galilee. So that's kind of the area we're talking about. And uh, the, the kind of gives you the background of what we're going to be talking about here. Miracles were pr to prove Jesus' deity, and they were to uh, prove that what he said was truth, and it was from God. He was God, God in the personage of a man, the personality of a man. And so in, in light of that, we'll be talking about the, the, the men's faith, the four men's faith. You know now by looking at Daniel, if you've been in class, we, the the, the five ruling powers, the four ruling powers were Babylonia, King Nebuchadnezzar. He was conquered. He was replaced by the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, you mean, you know, uh, Darius and uh, Cyrus. Uh, you know, the Cyrus decree, they got to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild Jerusalem. Uh, they were conquered by Greece, the Greece Empire, and then finally Rome. And so this is happening during the Roman Empire, that fourth major power. After the fourth major power, uh, we know that the, the kingdom of God was set up or during, during this fourth major power, Roman Empire. Okay, let's, let's read uh, uh, first uh, in, in chapter uh, 2, verses 1 through 12. That's Mark. Uh, what does the Lord Jesus look for in people? Some might say they look for holiness. Some people say they, they insist on the love that you have in yourself. Still others have differing ideas about uh, what Jesus looks for in people today and back then. One of the more interesting events in the life of Jesus is recorded in the opening verses of Mark. And we'll read that. Jesus came to Capernaum as his fame was at the highest point in his ministry, just a three-year ministry. 
People came in such numbers that the house where Jesus was located was overflowing. I mean, people couldn't even get the door. If you remember, you know, we've had our funeral here uh, before, and every seat was filled, and we had fold-up chairs around the auditorium, and people were standing in the back. They couldn't even get in the auditorium. Well, this is the way that house was. I went to a Ted, uh, Ted Cruz rally you know, earlier this year uh, out at the... Um, Union Assembly place, and there were so many people. It was filled up to the brim inside. There were so many people standing outside. He actually gave a speech there before he came inside to give a speech. But this is the way it was when Jesus was at Capernaum, and he's going to heal that man sick with palsy. People couldn't even get in the door. There were so many people. So here's where it gets interesting. Okay, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I'll be reading King James. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch as there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. They immediately, there were so many of them, they, they couldn't even get in the door. Verse 3, And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when we read these other scriptures, you're going to see it uses the word pronoun, they. But you have to read Mark here to say, well, there was four, there was four, four men that actually carried this man. And when they could not come nigh to him, him, Jesus, for the press or the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, uh, dick through this roof. They let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Now their roofs back then wasn't like ours. With the uh, gables, they were flat. Okay, so they went up on the roof. And lots of times people, they, they, they slept on top of the roofs because it was cooler at night. But anyway, this is where they went with the, with the man. <clears throat> Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, there being the uh, that pronoun being the, the four men. He said to the sick of the, the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, or teachers of the law. Remember that they went every jot and tittle of the law, the, the Pharisees did. And reasoning in their hearts, or thinking to themselves, Why does this man speak us blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, that they so reasoned, or he knew, you know, without them speaking, they didn't speak aloud, that they were thinking this in their hearts. So this is kind of where I thought, if, if people only knew, that was, that was really a second miracle right there. Jesus knew what they were thinking. Uh, he said to them, Why reason you the, ye these things in your hearts? Or why are you thinking these evil things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take thy bed and walk. Verse 10, but, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. That's why, that's, why he's doing, that's why he did this. And he said this to the man with the palsy. I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way unto thy house. And then verse 12, <clears throat> And immediately he rose. He, the pronoun, him, meaning the man of the palsy, took up the bed and went forth before them all. Or he went out of the presence of them all. Uh, insomuch as they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Or we never saw anything like this. And also, uh, the rendering of another version, it would say, it's, uh, he went before them all. So he did that in front of everybody in view. So this man arose in front of everybody present and uh, took up his bed and, and went home. <clears throat> okay, let's look over at Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 26. And the reason I want to start with verse 12 and... Uh, 12 through 16. Now the actual text, they're part of this story, this incident will be starting with 17, but I want you to show the press of the people that, I mean, they just thronged about Jesus in this ministry. They followed him everywhere. 
He healed the sick. He forgave sins. Uh, and it came to pass when he was in a certain city, this certain city being Capernaum, Capernaum, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Be thou clean, and immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Remember, they're still under the law of Moses. So according to the law of Moses, if you had leprosy, you were supposed to go before the priest and, and ask for forgiveness, and there were certain things you were supposed to do to be cleansed spiritually. Verse 15, but so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, him being Jesus, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness uh, and prayed. Now this verse 17, so there were throngs of people that, that's why this house was filled to overflowing where he healed this man of the palsy. Verse 17, it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching, he being Jesus, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by and were come out of every town in Galilee and Judea. Remember that by the, the Sea of Galilee, the northern part, and, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them, or as with him, with Jesus to heal them, the people that were coming to him. And behold, men brought in a bed, in, in a bed, a man which was taken with a palsy. And here it just says men brought. So you'd have to look at uh, Mark and see that there were four men that brought him. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him, or Jesus, lay him before Jesus. Verse 19, And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling, which his couch uh, with his couch or his bed and to the midst before Jesus. Or right in the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. They, they, let, they let, let him down in there. And when he saw their faith, there being the four men, he said to him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, or saying to theirself, uh, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? A blasphemy is a uh, usurpation of God. At that time, they didn't believe in. They didn't, you know, they didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah that they were looking for, and so they thought that Jesus was blaspheming, or usurping, or uh, of God. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Verse 22. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts and answering them, said unto them, What reason you in your hearts? See, he answered them, and they had him spoken it out loud. So. You know, they're probably wondering to themselves, how in the world he you know what I was thought was thinking? Verse 23, whether is uh, whether it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. And then he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy couch, the bed, your pallet, and go into thy house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that there whereupon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, that reverence, uh, saying, We have seen strange things this day. You know, they saw a wonder. They saw a miracle. They saw a, a, a happening that day. So we know that the certain city was Capernaum. We know that there were four men from reading these three different accounts, four different, three different accounts. <clears throat> the emphasis on this miracle is not on the man who was paralyzed as a miracle. You know, I thought if they would have known about it, it would be considered a miracle because he knew their thoughts before, before they did. They didn't even speak them. But the emphasis is on the four men who brought him to Christ. It was their pronoun, their faith, 
that brought the Lord's blessing on the man who was healed, or the paralyzed man. I wanted to define uh, uh, just what is palsy. You know, I wasn't for sure what it was, so I kind of kind of looked that up. And in some different places that I got, uh, it's Strong's number 3885, sick of the palsy. It's a person suffering from relaxing of the nerves on one side or parts of the body. They're disabled. They're weak of limb. Uh, means paralyzed or paralytic. Uh, sick of the palsy. Uh, it can also mean the, the whole bottom half, you know, because it said this man couldn't walk. So, the loss of sensation or the power of motion or both in any part of the body. Infirmities included under this name in the New Testament or palsy in the New Testament. The paralytic shock affecting the whole body. It could be affecting only one side. In this case, it was affecting this guy's lower half. He couldn't walk. Affecting the whole system below the neck. Uh, caused by contraction of the muscles in the whole or part of the body. This was very dangerous and often fatal back then. I'm just telling you that a little bit about how important this disease was to this man. Uh, the part affected remains immovable and diminishes in size or dries up, shrivels away. The hand was affected, was called a withered hand in Matthew chapter 12. Uh, it also says under this, the palsy it could be in the New Testament, it could be used as a dreadful disease caused by chills of the night. The limbs remain immovably fixed in the same position as it seized up. The person seems like suffering torture. Uh, it's frequently followed in a few days by death. Several paralytics were cured by Jesus, and this is just one of them. There was another one he cured, you know, that he had it for eight years, and he was cured. <clears throat> These four men, what does Jesus look for in us today? Our faith, the faith of these men. He looks for men who cared. These four men cared. These four men were not blind to the needs of their fellow man, that paralytic man. They forgot self and they helped this man in need. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 24, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Remember, he went around looking for his apostles. A lot of them were fishermen, some of them weren't. These men certainly acted in an unselfish way by carrying their friend to Jesus. The apostle Paul wrote a letter in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Only when we forget ourselves and seek to serve him can we be pleasing to God or the Lord. These four men showed their love for God by tending to the needs of their fellow man, that paralytic man, that man with the sick of the palsy. John says in John chapter 3, verses 16, 17, and 18, Hereby know we love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath the world's goods, and beholdeth his brother in need, and shutteth up his compassion from him, how doth the love of God abide in him? My little children, let not the love of the word, neither with the tongue, language, but in deed and truth. So we show it not in just what we say, but in deed and in truth. Love for God will cause us to love also our fellow men. 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, uh, I guess here the, the definition of hey, love, love less. Uh, He's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loves his brother also. That kind of reminds me of, you know, Stephen, doubting, or Thomas, doubting Thomas. And, uh, you know, he, he, he had faith because he got to feel the nail holes where the nails went in his hands, got to feel his side. But you didn't, and I didn't. So our faith, we have to, we have to believe this by faith. Yeah, it really, it really happened, and he was really killed. You know, Thomas, doubting Thomas, he doubted and he wanted to feel it, something physical. 
God cared and sent His only begotten Son to die for us. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and whoever believeth on Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Well, these four men cared, and they brought the paralytic to Jesus. So we must care and minister to the needs of the physical, for physical and spiritual. Uh, speaking of physical, one example we do, we have the, the food pantry. That's physical. But we also do a Bible class along with it. You know, I can't remember a time when, you know, Jesus fed many, thousands, but he always taught a lesson when he did it. So uh, he didn't just, you know, hand out food. So uh, he also fed the spiritual. Of those that live about us, uh, hear the anguish and the cry of Jeremiah, Jer uh, Lamentations 1.12. It's nothing to you, all that, that pass by. It is nothing to you, all you that pass by. And when there was a need we can feel, we dare not to be indifferent. We must consider one another. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. We have to reach out and we have to help each other, just as these four men did with this man paralyzed. And we don't know if that was a friend or an acquaintance or if they'd ever seen that man before. Well, Jesus also looked for men who tried. These four men tried. These men could have made all kinds of excuses. They could have sat back and waited for someone else to act. Uh, been complacent, having apathy, uh, sort of like we do today. They could have said, we can't get in the door. The door's blocked. So did they not act? they not try to do anything else? They could have said, this is way too much trouble. I mean, why, why should I bother? Why should we bother ourselves? But these four men, they set themselves a task. They intended to get the job done, and they did it. In 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 3 through 9, there's, a, there's something that kind of points this out with uh, the leprous man. Uh, now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Because remember, lepers, they cast out of the city. Uh, if we say, We will enter into the city, and then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. Uh, if they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. You know, because they were going to die anyway. They were cast out of the city. And remember at this time, the Syrians had, were besieging, uh, besieging the city. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the outermost part of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, this is the Syrians, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents, their horses, their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the outermost part of the camp, this is the camp that the Assyrians had just left, uh, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. And they came back and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. And they said one to another, we do not, we do not well this day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning night, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come. Let us go and tell the king's household. Well, Syrian army had encircled the city of Samaria and was starving the city into submission. And we know we looked at besieging and what sieging does, and that's what they do when they besiege a city. They're trying to starve them out, starve them to death. Well, these four lepers were outcasts outside the city, so that's how they could have gone into that Assyrian camp. They were hopeless and doomed anyway, so these four men, these four lepers chose to act, just as, just as the four friends of the, uh, the four men of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the men sick with the palsy. Their reasoning was simple. To stay in the city meant death, so why not go up to the enemy? The worst enemy we could do was kill us, Either way, they were dead, but maybe the enemy was spare them. And when they, they did try, you know, God calls them to hear the chariots, and they thought they were, 
they were going to be overtaken or, or slaughtered. So uh, they had left. The whole city was saved because these four lepers, who seemingly had little chance to do anything, but they tried to do something. They took action. They acted. Our failures today are not so much the fault of obstacles or problems as our own lack of effort or our apathy uh, on things that we don't want to even try to accomplish or act. Few of us realize what can be done. If we will try, Paul asked in Romans 8, verse 31, if God is for us, who is against us? Never overlook the help the Lord will give you. These four men at Capernaum saw the obstacles, but they tried, they acted, and the Lord rewarded their efforts. Let us be able to exclaim Paul in Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things in him that strengtheneth me. And Paul believed that he could accomplish anything with the Lord on his side. And with faith in the same Lord, we can do the same things today. If we only try, we have to act. He also looks for people, or looks in people, or looks in men, and these four men working together. They work together. Amos asked in Amos chapter 3, verse 3, Shall two walk together except they have agreed? And every effort that involves more than one person, in this case four, the need for unity is apparent. Had one of those four men wanted to go in a window, you know, instead of the roof, uh, another to get the crowd away from the door, then go through the door, another to come back tomorrow after most of the crowd was gone, uh, the poor man would have remained paralyzed forever. He wouldn't have been healed. If we would accomplish anything for the cause of the Lord, we must work together. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And that's Psalms 133, verse 1. Well, the Lord prayed for our unity. Neither for these only do I pray, but for them also that believe on me through their word, that they may be all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. And this is Jesus. John 17, verses 20 and 21. He wanted us to love one another. A new commandment uh, given here in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He wanted us to love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, your followers. And if you have loved one for another, and like the four men in Capernaum, we should put forth the effort to work together in unity. The church is like a physical body. And you know, you've seen that described before. In Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 12, 25 and 26, there should be no schism in the body, for that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffereth, all members suffer with it. Or one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. When we determine to work together and subjugate our own uh, desires and thoughts for the good of the common effort, almost anything can be accomplished. No one of the four men could have done this by themselves or brought this paralytic to Jesus. It took the cooperative essence, the unity of efforts of these four men together. Something else Jesus looks for and looked for in these men because you know they showed their faith. That's why he healed this man. Uh, is sharing Jesus. When Andrew found the Lord, his first action was to find his brother Peter. He wanted to share Jesus with his brother. Uh, John chapter 1, 40 and 42. One of the two that heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He findeth first his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted Christ. He brought him to Jesus. The desire to share the gospel of Christ prompted the early Christians to spread the word throughout the world. As Paul notes in Colossians 1.23, if so be that you continue in faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached in all creation under heaven, whereof I, Paul, was made a minister. When the persecution of, by unbelievers drove the Christians out of Jerusalem, and you know we know Saul, Paul, 
used to be one of the greatest persecutors. These people went about preaching the word. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. When the apostles were threatened and told not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus, they replied in Acts 4.20, We cannot but speak the things which we saw and heard. They wanted to share Christ. They wanted to share Jesus. They wanted to spare, to share God the Son. The most natural action in the world for the Christians should be telling others the good news. You know, we're uh, the Earl family, I guess, for the next three weeks. Well, they're sharing the good news over in the Marshall Islands. And uh, 2 Corinthians verse 4, chapter 4, verse 13. But having the same spirit of faith according to that which is written, I believe that therefore did I speak. We also believe and therefore also we speak. We, are, we live and therefore want to breathe. It's a natural thing to do. And if we belong to Christ, we will want to speak of Him. It's the natural thing to do. These four men in Mark 2 didn't need the healing power of Christ. They were healthy already, but they brought one that did need Jesus' healing hand. And the Christians are saved by His grace through our faith. Should be constantly telling the story of His grace to those who are lost in sin. And then finally, or, or he saw stumbling blocks. Jesus also saw some stumbling blocks. There were all those who blocked the door, selfishly taking the space for the passage of this, this paralytic. It was so badly needed. Jesus saw the hypocrisy of the Jews. Think of those people who were thinking in their own minds, well, how can he blaspheme or, or say arise and, and walk or say your sins are forgiven? He's not God. They didn't realize, you know, at the time that He was the Messiah. He was God the Son. And then there were those more interested in obstruction than the needs of the paralytic man. And in a similar way, there will be problems in our work of, for the Lord today. Some won't work. Some will work. Some won't, will move out of the door. Some of them uh, will move. Others will criticize not because they don't like the work, but because they don't like the one pro, pro, uh, proposing the work. Still others will work half-heartedly, merely delaying the work. We can expect obstructionists today, and we know we, we do. The Lord Jesus Christ still looks for people today who are like the four men at Capernaum. He looks for those who care. He looks for those who try. He looks for those who work together for His cause in unity and fellowship, and He looks for those who want to share Christ. Instead of getting uh, in the way of the Lord's work or hindering it, being a stumbling block, let us determine to be what those four men were, that the Lord's blessings may be served through us. So that's the lesson I thought I'd bring today, and I wanted to end with a with a statement that uh, I'm going to tell you about a friend, okay? And you might have seen this already. I have a good friend. He doesn't drink alcohol because he's never been involved in any alcohol-related crimes or embarrassments, you know, drunk driving, stuff like that. He doesn't destroy his mind through the use of illicit drugs. I've never once heard my friend gossip or tell a single lie. He never wastes his time in nightclubs, casinos, or questionable establishments. And I can't recall ever hearing him speak with profanity or vulgarity. And he has never cheated a soul in business. And many people, you know, by seeing all this, many people would call this friend, he's a good Christian. But what if he wasn't baptized? What if he's just a good man? And we have those people today. I know I have known people that would give you the shirt off their back. You never give them profanity or anything out of their mouth, and but they're not a Christian. They haven't been baptized. Okay, I want you to know that what we just described was uh, was a, this this person's dog patches. It wasn't a a man. We need to learn what being a Christian is all about. That being a Christian involves more than merely not doing evil. 
You know, we have to take that step. We have to take action. Being a Christian concerns actually doing good, fully submitting to Christ and living by faith. And we've been talking about these four men's faith. Christ taught, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Complete and total submission to Christ is essential if we're going to be called by his name, which is Christian. Like the brethren of Smyrna, all of us in Christ are expected to be faithful until death. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. You know, we don't retire from life. We don't retire from being a Christian. It's till, till death takes us or God comes again, or Jesus comes again. The world holds many good and honest souls who are not, uh, not maliciously engaged in the blackest of evils. You know, they're just known as good, good men, good people. Many of these good moral citizens are our neighbors, our friends, our relatives. They may in some cases be more moral than some of the church's, uh, you know, fence setters. Uh, but they should not, by virtue of their upstanding lifestyles, be confused with good Christians. They may refrain from wrong, and they may be involved in promoting much that is right, but outside of Christ, they can't be considered Christians. Not until one becomes to Christ and obeys the gospel is one a Christian. No one can live a pure life enough to save himself. And there is still no other name to save us except the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. So we have to remember there's a world between just good people but, but Christians, which are good people. So I want you to go to heaven. Jesus wants you to go to heaven. God the Father wants you to go to heaven. And the only way to do that is to become a Christian. The way we become a Christian is to be baptizing to Him. So now I want to ask you if you have that need, while we stand and sing, I want you to come forward now. <clears throat>